Hey Mohawks, today we're going to go ahead and talk about 5.1, revisiting the atomic model, because we have a little, excuse me, a little bit of an a, a, uh, addition to it uh, with this section. So let's go ahead and look at the first one. It says, why do scientists use mathematical models to describe the position of electrons uh, in an atom? Well, they use a mathematical model because a mathematical model uh, is a lot easier than a physical model because if we use the physical model it just doesn't work because we really don't know where the electrons are so let's go ahead and see what the book has the book says excuse me the book says shown here is a life-size model of a skier but not all models are physical in fact the current model for the atom is mathematical and that's because a physical model just doesn't show us exactly where the electrons are. Matter of fact, a mathematical model just gives us a probability of where we're going to find it. So. Have you ever looked carefully at the intro for this show? I mean, really carefully? If you have, you might have noticed that there's a diagram of an atom with little electrons <laughs> orbiting the nucleus. But here's the thing. Atoms don't actually look like that. Over the years, scientists have come up with different atomic models based on what we know about how they work. The atomic model that's in the SciShow intro was one of them, and it has a lot of history behind it. But the most accurate atomic models are a little more complicated, because atoms are complicated. By the start of the 20th century, scientists knew that atoms were made up of negatively charged electrons, plus some sort of positive charge. The tricky part was figuring out how these charges fit together. The running theory was that the electrons were embedded in a positive sphere which was called the plum pudding model because it looked like a traditional Christmas pudding. But that all changed around 1911, when a scientist named Ernest Rutherford, along with his team at Manchester University, published the results of the famous gold foil experiment. Rutherford and his colleagues fired alpha particles, which are positively charged, at thin gold foil. According to the plum pudding model, the alpha particles should have just passed straight through the foil because atoms would be mostly empty space with some charges scattered around. And atoms are mostly empty space. So most of the alpha particles did pass straight through the foil. But to Rutherford's surprise, some alpha particles were deflected by a lot. He concluded that an atom's positive charge was concentrated in a tiny central nucleus. And these nuclei were deflecting alpha particles that bounced off of them. He also predicted that the electrons were orbiting around the nucleus kind of like how planets orbit the sun. That's why this model is sometimes called the planetary model. Rutherford was right about protons being in the middle with electrons around them. And you'll still see his model used today to explain the very basics of the atom. It's the one in the SciShow intro. But there was one major problem with the planetary model. It predicted that orbiting electrons would lose energy in the form of radiation, which would make them spiral inward and eventually crash into the nucleus. This implies that all atoms would eventually collapse. But we know that stable atoms do exist, so there had to be something missing. Just two years later, in 1913, Danish scientist Niels Bohr proposed an adjustment to the Rutherford model that solved this problem. Bohr's model predicted that electrons orbit at very specific energy levels, which he called orbits. The electrons could only orbit at precisely those levels, and so they couldn't spiral inward. An electron could switch levels if it absorbed or released some energy, but only specific discrete levels were allowed, and electrons couldn't go below the lowest level. That explained why stable atoms didn't just collapse. Bohr's model quickly became the most popular model of an atom, and it's often used today to show the basic way that an atom is arranged. But it still wasn't totally right. One breakthrough was in 1932, when English physicist James Chadwick discovered that neutrons exist. Neutrons weren't electrically charged, and they helped explain why the nucleus was so heavy. Another breakthrough involved quantum mechanics, and the idea that electrons don't necessarily orbit the nucleus at all. In fact, electrons aren't even really in a specific place at any given time. Instead, they're kind of in lots of different places at once within a bigger area. Then, when you actually measure an electron, suddenly it's in one specific spot within that area. It's a weird concept that's very different from the way that we normally experience the world. 
but that's on the mechanics for you. The area where you might find it if you try to measure it is called the electron cloud. In diagrams, normally the cloud is drawn darker where there's a high probability of the electron being there when you measure it. With the most basic atoms, like hydrogen and helium, this cloud looks kind of like a big sphere. And it turns out that electrons have the highest probability of being in one of four's orbits, which is why you can use Bohr's model to simplify things. But when you get into bigger and bigger atoms with more and more electrons, these clouds begin to interfere with each other and start to have weirder shapes. So the electron cloud model is the most up-to-date model of an atom, and it's used by scientists around the world. But that doesn't make the other models useless. Like Bohr's model can be helpful if you need to focus on energy levels and radiation. But if you're studying chemical bonds, you might need the electron cloud model to know where the electrons are. And if you want a model that shows off the fundamentals and still looks pretty cool, you might want to go for the planetary model. Thanks for watching this episode of SciShow, which was brought to you by our patrons on Patreon. If you want to help support this show, go to patreon.com slash SciShow. Okay, let's go ahead and bring this, uh, bring me back a little bit. And now again, we're going to talk more about these models just like they talked about before. So what did uh, Bohr propose in his model of the atom? That's what we're really gonna, we're gonna talk about. So, well, we have to go with the limitations of Rutherford's model. So Rutherford, uh, it explained only a few simple properties. It didn't explain anything else. One of the big things, it didn't explain how things were chemically reactive. Okay, so it didn't talk about the chemical properties of elements. Okay, for example, when you heated something up and it got a changed color, when you heated a metal up, how did it change color? Well, to be honest, it's not in the heating up of the metal, but it's in when the metals start to cool off. Because when you heat up a metal, you're actually exciting the electrons. Those electrons jump to the next orbital, and when they fall back an orbital, they give off a quantum of energy called a photon. And we see that as light, okay? And the lower frequency of that is gonna be more red and the higher frequency is gonna be a brighter white and or uh, as we get closer to violet or something like that in the Roy Biv aspect. So Niels Bohr came up with uh, a new atomic model that changed Rutherford's model because he incorporated newer discoveries. And how did he do that? Well, he knew that atoms absorb energy, and then when the electrons, when the energy goes back, it emits light. And again, and how did he do that? Well, he proposed that an electron is found only in specific circular orbits or paths <coughs> around a nucleus, okay? which each possible electron's orbit had a fixed energy in it. And he called that fixed energy uh, of each one of those energy levels, he called them energy levels, and that electrons would be in those energy levels at that fixed energy, okay? He said that if the energy level or the energy required to move the electron from one level to a higher energy level, he called that a quantum of energy. And all quantum just means is a certain amount of energy. Okay, it's easier to kind of understand by looking at these rungs and this ladder. This was Bohr's model. Notice that the closer that you get to the nucleus, and the nucleus is down here at the bottom, okay, the energy levels are further apart. They have to get closer together because, to be honest, it takes less and less energy to hold them in that orbit further out. But when an electron would go from one rung to the next rung, it used that quantum of energy to get up there. And then when it dropped back down, it gave off that quantum of energy in the form of a photon, which is light that we see. But he also said that you couldn't just put some energy in it and let it go halfway. It, had, it was all of that rung or nothing. So when you go up a ladder and you step from one rung to the next, you're, you can't step in the middle because there are no rungs there. So you have to go one or the other, and they keep getting closer as you get to the top or the outermost energy levels. So how did Bohr's model improve upon Rutherford's model? Well, Rutherford's model could not explain uh, that 
why elements that have been heated to a higher energy level or higher, higher temperatures give off different colors of light. Well, Bohr's model did that by saying that the electrons would bump up to another energy level. And then when they came back down, they emitted that light. And again, that was in the form of a photon. So the quantum mechanical model. Well, here's what we need to know about the quantum mechanical model is what does the what does this model determine about the electrons in an orbit? Well, as Bohr said, we had electrons in certain energy levels, and that's where we're going to find them. Well, the quantum mechanical model said <clears throat> that they're not just in one orbit. They're in multiple orbits or multiple uh, orbitals, and we don't know exactly where they're at. Okay? Schrodinger was someone that came up with a theoretical calculations or a mathematical model. And he called that the quantum mechanical model, which basically described or said where uh, in atoms, it was a mathematical solution. We don't really need to know what that solution was to know how it worked. Okay, so like Bohr's model, the quantum mechanical model had the atoms was restricted to energy of electrons and certain values. Okay, but unlike it did, does not specify the exact path that the electron takes. Okay, so the quantum mechanical model determines uh, the allowed energies an electron can have and how likely it is to find that electron in various locations around the nucleus of the atom. What it boils down to is the probability of finding it in something called the electron cloud, where Bohr's model said we're gonna find them at each energy level the electron cloud is just anywhere that could be around that electron. So here's an electron cloud. It's a fuzzy reason around it. The quantum mechanical problem said we're going to find it somewhere within that cloud. We don't know exactly where, but we're going to find it there. That's where we're going to find it, somewhere there. Okay. And it goes on to with orbitals and a few other things. So how are quantum uh, the quantum mechanical model and Bohr's model alike, and how are they different? Remember, they're light because they talk about it. It restricts the energy of the electrons to certain values. Unlike Bohr's model, well, the quantum mechanical model does not specify the exact path the electron takes around the nucleus. Okay, So how do sublevels of principal energy levels differ? So we're basically talking about the different types of orbitals. Well, in the quantum mechanical model, we have four different orbitals that we'll talk about. Okay, we can call them energy levels. Now again, so we have atomic orbitals. There are four of them. And they have different shapes that we're going to talk about. And they can hold different types of electrons. So each uh, energy sublevel corresponds to one or more orbitals of different shapes. The orbitals describe where the electrons are likely to be found. Now this right here is the first orbital. It's the one closest to the nucleus. It is the s orbital. And again, if we pulled in a periodic table, and if I just kind of pull this periodic table in, one thing that it would show is that these first two columns are the s orbitals. So here's our first s orbital. We have hydrogen and helium. But notice that it has two electrons, two protons, two electrons, and they, they take up that s orbital. Let me go ahead and throw, shove that back. Okay, as we move on, we have the p orbitals. Well, the p orbitals represent the last six on the periodic table. Now, that means that since <coughs> excuse me, each orbital can only hold two electrons, we have three p orbitals. And all three of those p orbitals are arranged in a different plane, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. So for a given principal energy level greater than 1, there is 1s orbital, okay? There's 3p orbitals, and they all, notice, are on different planes, okay? So this would be the first two elements. This would be 3a, 4a, 5a, 6a, 7a, 8a, and that means we'd have 8 valence electrons. In the fifth orbital, and I'll scroll this up, notice that there's five, or I should say the d orbital. 
there are five orbitals, each one holding uh, can hold two electrons. Notice they're in different planes and different shapes. But also, what are they represented by the periodic table? Well, if I come over here and look at the periodic table, I would say that here's our d orbitals. So here was the s, here's the p, these are the d orbitals, and there are 10 of them across there. They would be represented by <coughs> the old style, the b group. 3b through 2b. So 3b, 4b, 5b, 6b, 7b, 8b, 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 1b, 2b. Okay, let me pull this back. And if I went to the f orbitals, which are even more complicated, those would be the ones at the very bottom. And notice that there are seven f, f orbitals with two electrons for a total of 10 elements across that page. Okay. So again, there is five different d orbitals for a total of 10 holding 10 electrons. Hi, it's Paul Anderson, and this is Chemistry Essentials video 007. And it's on the quantum mechanical model. In other words, it's going to be our current model of what an atom looks like. Before we had this uh, quantum mechanical model, we had what was called a shell diagram. And so when you look at neon, neon had two electrons in the first shell, and then it would have eight electrons in the next shell. And we figured that out by looking at spectral data. And so what we've discovered since then is um, uncertainty in those electrons and a little bit more of the characteristics of electrons. And so this has kind of been replaced with the quantum mechanical model. Now the shell model works great at making predictions, and so does the quantum mechanical model. They're just different theoretical um, concepts of what an atom looks like. And so our shell model really is based on Coulomb's law, which talks about the the interactions between protons and electrons. But there's a couple of things about electrons that we discovered. One was the uncertainty principle. In other words, when you're looking at an electron, the act of light bouncing off of that and coming back to you changes the momentum of the electron. So you can never know both the location and the momentum of an electron. There's uncertainty there. And so they live in these clouds of probability. And so um, since they don't follow specific orbits, we came up with this new term, which is an orbital, which is where they're going to spend their time. Another important thing about electrons is that they have spin. So they're going to either have a clockwise magnetic spin or a counterclockwise magnetic spin. And as a result of that, you can only have two in every orbital. And so we really had to throw out this idea of the shell, or at least modify it so it fit with the data. And so now we have this quantum mechanical model, and we can use complex equations and computers to develop software that predicts how atoms are really going to interact. So Coulomb's law, remember, predicted where electrons are going to be. You have these positive charges on the inside, and you have these negative charges of the electron. And so the larger these charges get, the larger the force holding them together is going to be. But as they move away, as the radius increases, we're going to decrease that force. But there's two problems with that general shell model. Number one, they don't flow in these specific orbits, and that's because of uh, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. And then the other one is that spin means we can only have two electrons in every orbit. And so this idea of eight in one shell is just not going to work. And so there are these orbitals. And if we start on the inside, the first one's going to be called the S orbital. And then we move to these things, uh, which are polar. And so we call those uh, the P orbitals. They don't come from polar, but that's how I remember it. Then we move into the d orbitals, and then we move into the f orbitals. I don't know if I have those, but essentially they're all of these clouds of probability where electrons sit. And so we have what are called quantum numbers, and the first three are going to determine what that orbital looks like. So the first one is going to be n, and that's going to be the size of the orbital. As n gets larger, then that area of which those electrons are going to be is going to get larger. We next have l, which is going to be the shape of that orbital. It could be an s, a p, a d, or an f. Then we move into the orientation, which is going to be m sub l. And, and so s can only have one orientation. P can have three orientations. And so it just goes 1, 3, 5, 7. And so when we're adding in the orbital diagram, as we're adding electrons to it, we're going to put a lot more electrons in the orbitals of the f subgroup than we are, uh, of, for example, the p. And then there's going to be the spin. And since those electrons have spin, it's counterclockwise or clockwise, we can only put two in every orbital. And so what we can do is we can develop Schrodinger's equation as an example of that that's going to predict where these electrons are found. 
And by doing that, we can predict not only what an atom looks like, but how atom atoms are going to interact. And it's so complex that lots of times we need computers to do that. And so did you learn how the quantum mechanical model can refine the classical shell model? Well, I would point you to these two things, uncertainty of the electrons and the spin. And it's not like we throw out the shell model. It's just that we're getting better and better models of what an atom looks like, right, based on the data that we're getting. We'll talk about that in the next video, but I hope that was helpful. Okay, so now when we go ahead and talk about uh, that, we can kind of throw away a few things and talk about a few things. Now, the principal energy level is going to be N, and that's going to be equal to 1. So again, that's going to have the S orbital. There's going to be one S orbital. That S orbital can hold a maximum of two electrons. We go to the next energy level, which is N is equal to 2. Okay, that means that we're going to have our, our S orbitals, which one, but we're going to have three P orbitals. Remember, each one of those P orbitals can hold two electrons, along with the one orbital from the S, that's for a total of eight. We move on to the next energy level. We have three orbitals. We have the S, which is there's one orbital, it can hold two electrons. The P, there's three, which can hold two each for a total of six. And then there's the D, which are five orbitals, which can hold a total of 10 for a total of 18. And if we go down to the fourth one, we're going to have the same thing of 32. Now, these numbers should look familiar with you because they're numbers that we have at the edge of the periodic table on the right side. In the first period, we have a 2. In the second period, we have an 8. Third period, we have an 8. Fourth period, we have an 18. Fifth, 18. Sixth, 32. And seven, 32. Okay, so that's kind of helps you with those, making sure that those numbers. We're not going to worry about the N numbers over here. We're just going to talk about the period and what orbitals they're in when we start doing electron configuration. So why do scientists no longer use a physical model to describe the motion of electrons? It's because they don't know where the electrons are at. They could be anywhere else. The previous models of electrons were physical based on the motion of large objects. Well, these are so small, we don't know exactly where they're at. So the calculations and experimental results showed these models didn't always correctly describe where the electron or the electron motion or where they were at. Schrodinger's model did do that, but again, that's a complex model, and we're not going to really worry about too much, but we just know that his model is of mathematical equation is what the quantum mechanical model is based on. Okay, let's go on to the next, or the last little bit. This is it. Our key concepts, you can see that there are three. We'll let you read them. You can always go back into the section review and go ahead and, or I should say the chapter slides. So the four or the five one uh, lecture slides, you'll be able to find those. Along with, again, at the end here, we have our vocabulary. And so you can see that we have uh, all of our vocabulary. Well, I'm going to stop right there. We'll let you look at the slides in order to get the answers to this. Hey, as always, go Mohawks. Nelson out.